message. Junior high, senior high. Uh, get a go with Josh this time. Jared's back here going, whoo! Uh, so. <laughs> now we really appreciate Jared filling in and uh, he is, he's setting out today to show you that you can survive this whenever we call upon you to go back with him, right? So how's that? Now he did a great job. I've heard the kids talk about it. Thank you so very much. We appreciate it. Today I want to continue on in the series, The Word. Today the Word became sacrifice. The Word becomes sacrifice. I might ask the question, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? In many ways, we are like the people in Old Testament times. Now I know we live in a, a, a lot more luxurious world than they lived in and a lot more conveniences and all that go on. But they had experienced the blessings of God, but they didn't take time to recognize it. God has just poured out His blessings time and time and time again. Whenever the country was in famine, God would take care of it. Whenever uh, there was enemies that were larger than them, God was there. But they never appreciated it. And because of that, they never did really know God the way God wanted, him to, wanted them to know Him. Now history shows us very much the same. That we are a people who sometimes we just take God for granted. We just expect it all to be there. We've become very complacent and unappreciative. We can look in uh, the 911. Boy, church attendance just boomed because we had a fear. And what, where did we turn? We turned to God because we wanted God to bail us out, to be with us. The attack on America, it frightened us all. We didn't think that had ever happened. And yet the churches would be filled just for a short time and then we'd be right back to where we were. The immediate danger had passed. So what's the big deal? Well the big deal is God loves you and He desires to have a relationship with you. And He's planned for this relationship ever since the beginning. And sometimes we don't want to take time to look at God's plan. Well today you're going to take time and look at God's plan with me because that's what the sermon's about. Is a plan of God to let you know just how much He loves you. See the Old Testament sacrifices were not sufficient. Old Testament sacrifices were not sufficient. In fact the Old Testament sacrifice did not provide for forgiveness. Did not provide for forgiveness. It was only a temporary relief if you will. It was a matter of pushing your sins forward. We've talked about that in Bible study many times. It wasn't sufficient or satisfying to God at all. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5 through 10 will say this. Therefore when Christ came into the world he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, here am I, it is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do you, your will, my God. First he said, sacrifice and offering, burn offerings, sin offerings, you did not desire nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here am I, I have come to do your will. He set aside the first to establish the second. And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once more for all, once for all. He loved us. He wanted that relationship. He wanted a love relationship, not a sacrifice relationship. So the God of the Old Testament is no different than the God of the New Testament. It's just like today, people were not loving God. They were looking for what God could do for them, but when it come down to having a relationship, they didn't want that. They wanted His benefits, but not His presence. So as we see it all start to unfold, we're going to realize that in the Old Testament as they would make those sacrifices, as they would push those sins forward, there was going to be something really lacking. There's going to be something that is totally missing. Hosea chapter 6 verse 6 will say this, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. The acknowledgement of God. How many times do we not acknowledge God? I want all of you to take a moment now and walk through your past week. I ask you to pick out that blessing that you had that was so very important to you. That's one that you've acknowledged right there. That's one blessing that you're acknowledging. Is there anyone who would believe that God was not with you every day last week? Is there anyone who would think that every day I'd, I receive some wonderful blessing from God in some way? 
Now, what was that way? Folks, they'll vary what God did for me and what God did for you. It, it will vary the blessings that will come our way. I sat down with a, uh, a family this week and, and just watched how God had worked in their life and realized the very power of what he was doing. Now, the family, I don't know if they felt the blessing as much as I did. But God was using it to reinforce my ministry. To reaffirm, Mike, what you're doing has meaning and purpose. So I acknowledge God. Thank you, God, for the blessing that you've poured out upon that family. I see it, Lord, and I'm thankful for it. I want all of you to think about someone that you may have seen blessed. Someone that you personally saw God just pouring out blessings. Maybe they didn't see it, but you did. You saw how God was working in their life. Now, whose benefit was that for? Maybe the blessing was for the benefit of the family that was there. Or maybe that was all for your benefit. As we looked and we saw God pouring it out, it is us who says, God, I acknowledge you. Thank you. I see it. I've beheld the presence of God. I know that he is there. Well, in the Old Testament, just like today, there were so few that were acknowledging the presence of God. So few that were acknowledging the blessings that they were seeing poured out upon the nation of Israel. Israel was a nation all by itself. And there were pagan nations all around it. But yet, they didn't realize we have one God. They have many false gods. And often would take it for granted. Each of us should realize and acknowledge God's presence in our life. Each of us should take a moment to do that. That's one of the failures that we see in the Old Testament. It wasn't there. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9. This is one that's really important. This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. Now we're getting down to the bare essentials about the offerings of the Old Testament. Remember I said it was the pushing forward of sins so that those sins, the burdens of those sins are not laid heavily upon the people. See, it wasn't able to clear their conscience. There's something about this thing of forgiveness. You may have trouble forgiving yourself. That's the next point. We're going to deal with that. But in the Old Testament, they didn't have that option. All they had was they could make sacrifices and it would push the sins forward. And it wasn't sufficient to clear their conscience of the sin that they've done against God. See, we've got to make sure that our conscience is, is working. That whenever I sin against God and whenever I have just fallen miserably into the mire of sin, that I realize I can be forgiven. Amen. That can happen. But in the Old Testament, it couldn't. It was all sacrifice, just pushing it ahead so that you didn't have the burden of that sin resting upon you. So that you could go ahead and function in life. They had to bear that each and every day. And they would push it ahead and then it would build back up. And then they'd push it ahead and it'd build back up. And the sins become so burdensome to them that there was no way to relieve their conscience of what they had done. Now all of those things show why the Old Testament sacrifices were insufficient. So folks, some say, well, why did God have to give a son? We were doing sacrifices in the Old Testament time. Why couldn't we do that today? Well, that's ridiculous. They didn't work. It was God's plan to introduce to us a perfect sacrifice. It wasn't his plan for us to stay in that. For all of us who have spent some time in school, you don't start out immediately in English full-blowing. You start out with a little bit here, run, dick, run. And pretty soon you start learning. You don't start out reading encyclopedias, you start out reading those little kid books. I still kind of prefer them most of the time. Uh, so, uh, they, they, I always like that hay foot, straw foot. But anyway, you don't start out immediately knowing all of your math. You have to work at it. Or Megan will work you at it, one or the other. So, it just happens. You don't just start out knowing. So, God didn't start us out immediately saying, here's a sacrifice that will cure it all. We started out with sacrifices to push the sins forward, hoping that we would grow in appreciation, hoping the people of the Old Testament would grow in appreciation of God. But they didn't. 
They didn't. But now God has a more perfect plan. The plan is unfolding and as the plan is unfolding it's all going to start showing where we're at today. Jesus' sacrifice was perfect. Romans chapter 3 verse 25 will say this. God, pre whoops. Uh, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance He had left the sins co committed beforehand unpunished. He had left sins committed unpunished. Now the sins of the Old Testament, no one ever paid a price for them. Those animal sacrifices of grain offerings and all of that, they didn't pay a price. It just pushed them forward. There was never a price paid. It wasn't until the atoning blood of Jesus was the price paid, was redemption given, redemption to buy back. Now some of you are as old as me or older. You remember the glass pop bottles? You remember them? Now, where I grew up, you could get two cents for one. If you go and redeem the pop bottle. How many of you have worked streets or ditches and you picked up pop bottles so that you could get another pop? Well, of course you could. Of course, all you had to do was get five because a pop was a dime. Some of you are really old. So, uh, you kind of remember those days. Uh-huh. So, we would work the street. Now, back in the country would work the road ditch. I always appreciate those old farmers letting those pop bottles fly, especially if they didn't hit it and break something. Because we'd work the road ditch and pretty soon we'd have enough pop bottles we could redeem them and get our two cents and get a bottle of pop. A bottle of pop. Well, it's a buying back. That was a buying back process that the soda companies had. The redemption of your soul was a buying back process. And the price was Jesus. God's son had to shed his blood and the word would be a sacrifice because the word was Jesus, the word was God. So they would buy him back, he bought back. But now often we say this was about Jesus. This was demanding of both the father and the son. It was God's plan and he knew that the plan was expensive and he knew what had to be done. He understood how it all unfolded. He put it in place. He made it right. He made it perfect. But there's a price to be paid even by God the Creator, His Son. As a son it's easier to be obedient than it is for a father to say I'm sending you. It's easier for the son to say I will go and do that, Father, than it is for the Father to say, I need for you to go and die. Many of you men and women who went off to service, it was tough on you, but it was probably tougher on mom and dad as you left because they worried about your return. This is the Father sending his son off to do something that he know he's going to die at. And he knows there's no choice. It was demanding of both of them. Galatians chapter 4, the first part of verse 4 will say, But when uh, the set time had fully come, God uh, sent his Son. In the fullness of time, God sent Jesus. Everything was right. There was one language throughout the world that was pretty well known. There was the opportunity to be able to, to there was quarters of trade where the word would be able to go everywhere. It's not going to be just confined to Israel. So in the fullness of time, time is right right now. And God sent Jesus. And as Jesus dies for the preparation that Israel had been going through to know that the Messiah has come. And as all of that is unfolding, now there's opportunity for the, the word to go far and wide around the world. And there's going to be apostles who are going to take it throughout the land. Everything was right that the message could go, then people had to receive it. They had to be able to recognize it. They had to be uh, taking religion of the world that day out of control. The religion of the world was divided into two areas. There was the, the Jewish people who worshiped one God, just like it was in the Old Testament. And there's uh, the rest of the world who were worshiping many gods. There was gods of Rome. Remember what Paul would say in, in Acts somewhere around 16, as I passed by I beheld an altar to the unknown God whom you therefore worship in ignorance. 
So as he was going into the, the city of Athens, he said, look, even here there's rows of statues of gods. But he said, now here's one that's unknown. He said, I've come to proclaim that unknown God to you. The price had to be paid. The fullness of time have come so that we could know redemption. So that you and I could be bought back. That the price could be paid. The time of sacrifice is for forgiveness. It's not for the pushing forward of sin. This time it's for forgiveness. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 11 through 14. Day after day every priest stands and performs his religious duty. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices. Which can never take away sin. But when this priest, this priest is Jesus. When this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin. He sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. No other sacrifice is ever going to be demanded. One sacrifice for all time. Never again were you going to be required to make an animal sacrifice, a grain sacrifice. Never again were you going to be required to do that. You're going to be asked to give a portion of what God has blessed you with. But never again were you going to have to go and bring a dove or a bull or a lamb to an altar and still not have your sins forgiven. He said this one sacrifice. That this priest is so sufficient that he'll never have to offer a sacrifice again. No more someone else to speak for you. See they'd take their sacrifices to the temple and the priest would meet them, or to the tabernacle, and the priest would meet them. Remember with Samuel, whenever his mother Hannah come to the tabernacle, Eli was the priest sitting at the door. Now how was she going to speak to God? She would go into the tabernacle and pray, but it would be the priest who would make those petitions through the offerings. Today, folks, you don't have to do that. You don't have to come and talk to a minister or a priest. You can talk to Jesus. You can talk to God through Jesus. We have one advocate, Jesus. We have one that we pray through. He is the one who is going to carry the message. We have that. Because the Word become flesh. And because the Word become a sacrifice. So that you could have life and have it more abundantly. That's what God has done for us. He has separated us from all others by being able to do this. Now Christ is our mediator. The only mediator that we need. But now wait, something did change with the sacrifice of Jesus. See, before it was on God in the Old Testament. Now why would I say it was on God? Well, it's up to you to bring your sacrifices. But remember, He hadn't made anyone pay the price for sin. But now it's on you because he made Jesus pay the price. And now you are more a free moral agent than ever before. You have the choice to either come or not to come. You have the choice to either accept or not to accept. You have the choice to worship or not to worship. Because you know today when you come in faith, you can trust that God hears in your prayers. You know that today whenever you come in faith that you can get closer to Him and have that personal relationship that the people of the Old Testament never knew. You have that privilege. But you don't have to use it. It's on you. God kept pleading with the people of the Old Testament to, to get into the system that He had designed. And He would pour blessings upon blessings. And they never made it. They didn't get there. So do I have the faith? It's on me. Do I want a relationship? It's on me. Do I want to be forgiven? It's on me. It's no longer that I can't be. I can be. Do I really love God? Well, it's on me. More than anyone else. Now I know God had a plan to save me. He's made that plan very, very clear. He showed that the sacrifices of the Old Testament were insufficient. He showed that the sacrifice of Jesus was perfect. Now there's only one other thing. 
that you become a living sacrifice, the Roman letter would say, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. Yes, see, God did all that for you. For each one of you, God has given you that right to become his child. For each one of us, he has given us the privilege to sit down at his table and to know him up close and personal. John chapter 3, verse 16, you all know so very well. For God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave his son. Remember that decision I talked about? It had to be the father's decision as well as the son's. It had to be God who sent and Jesus who did. It was the father who said, we have to go. And he went and took care of it. God made it personal. Let me share just a few things with you. It's not in your bulletin. You may want to write some of these down. You may not. Here's the part I want to close with. We knew it was coming. The people at the time of Jesus who act so ignorant knew it was coming. They crucified him with sinners. We were told that in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 12. And you'll find it in Matthew chapter 27 verse 38. Crucified with sinners, Isaiah 53 12, Matthew 27 38. They said they would pierce his hands, that his hands and his feet would be pierced. Psalms 22 16, John 20 and verse 27. Hands and feet pierced, Psalms 22 16, John 20 27. He would be insulted. Psalms 22, 6. Matthew 27, 39 and 40. Insulted. Psalms 22, 6. Matthew 27, 39 and 40. That he'd be given vinegar and gall while on the cross. Psalm 69, 21. John 19, 29. Vinegar and gold, Psalm 69, 21, John 19, 29. That he would be mocked. We knew it was coming. Psalms 22, 8. Matthew 27, 43. Mocked. Psalms 22, 8. Matthew 27, 43. We knew that his side would be pierced. Zechariah 12, 10. John 19, 34. Side peers, Zechariah 12, 10, John 19, 34. We knew that they would cast lots for his clothing. Psalms 22, 18, Mark 15, 24. That they would cast lots for his clothing. Psalms 22, 18, Mark 15, 24. And we knew that not a single bone would be broken. He'd be a perfect sacrifice. Psalms 34, 20, John 19, 33. Psalms 34, 20, John 19, 33. Jesus' sacrifice was perfect. And because of that, we can have life and have it more abundantly. Or we can choose not to know life at all. Because see, now it is totally your choice. Sometimes we don't forgive ourselves when we sin. Most of us have dealt with that throughout our life. We may believe that God has forgiven us, but it's just awful hard to forgive myself. Here's the good news. He was a perfect sacrifice. And as a perfect sacrifice, it was perfect forgiveness. So trust Him and forgive yourselves. Trust Him and let those things go. Our God loved us so much. Can anyone tell me what's going on in the world today? What's the deal? This all sounded pretty simple to me today. I think it's about the simplest sermon I've preached. He loved me. That settled it. Now it's on me. Will you please stand as we have our invitation?
tonight. Thank you all very much for being here. As a day grew, the attendance did too, so that's been very good. Thanks for that. We want to encourage you, as Josh said, we've got Easter coming up. It's two weeks away. Be thinking about someone to bring with you. We, we'd like to see the, the seams being pushed here just a little bit, so let's stretch it a little. Um, if you'll get it up to 500, I'll count it 550, so I'll just make a deal with you. So uh, I'll do my part, you do yours. So anyway, please keep that in mind next week. The, isn't it next week, the choir? Choir and guitars uh, will be playing. So we're looking forward to that. Encourage you to be out for that. Make it a big day as well. Today at uh, 4 o'clock, tea time for ladies and little ladies. And serving time for men and old men. Okay? So uh, we need some of you to come and help with that, guys. So uh, if you can, come out be a part of that. And uh, we'll serve the little ladies and the ladies. All right? So... Uh, we're not playing it for, right? So everything's good. So we can expect you to be there. All right. Thank you again for being here. God bless you. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, may we leave rejoicing that we've been in your house. And may we leave knowing that indeed we live in the best of times because we choose to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.